Hello and welcome to the newly reformatted Balmer Speaker Series, now called the Balmer Conversations. I'm John Davis. I'm an assistant professor here at the Knowlton School of Architecture. This summer, the Balmer Committee decided to change the way we asked our guests to present using our new, improved, and somewhat unorthodox format to have a conversation with our guests and dive deeper into some of the questions of design that come up after seeing their work. Tonight, I'll be joined in interviewing our guest by Knowlton's own Karen Lewis. Those viewing this live will also have the opportunity to submit questions using the chat feature, which will then be re relayed to Karen and I. We're joined this evening by Silas Monroe. Silas is a graphic designer, writer, and educator based in Los Angeles. He is the founder of the firm Polymode, which provides a range of design services and has amassed an impressive list of clients, including MoMA, Housing Works, the US State Department, and the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign. Silas is currently an assistant professor in communication arts and graphic design at the Otis College of Art and Design, and holds an MFA from CalArts and a BFA from RISD. Recently, he completed a collaboration with Whitney Battle Baptiste and Britt Russert to publish and contextualize the stunning data visualizations made by the American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois entitled Data Portraits Visualizing Black America. Silas, welcome. Thanks so much, John. It's really nice to be here. I'm going to share my screen. How's that looking? Good? Okay. Uh, thanks again, John um, and Karen for inviting me and also thank you, Eric, so much. Um, I'm really um, honored to be part of this reformation of this lecture series. And um, before I get started, uh, giving this talk after the recent revolutions around Black Lives Matter movements sparked by George, George Floyd's murder has had a different resonance for me. And adding Jacob Blake's name to a very long list of Black people who have been murdered because of systemic racism and police brutality is pretty heavy for me. So I'm feeling pretty emotional uh, at this moment talking about this. And I just wanna give permission to myself and permission to all of us in this process of accepting this difficult reality of feeling these intense emotions. And I feel like that connects to what I'm gonna talk about because I see design as an emotional act. And there's a, a sensory quality, particularly in Du Bois's work with his students um, that has a sensory quality that is really about feeling and, and, and connecting to actually a counter position to racism and to the history of slavery. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm beaming into you from the unceded lands of the Chumash, Tonga, and Kitts people, also known as Inglewood, which is part of Los Angeles, as was mentioned. And I'm here to share some research with you all about W.B. Du Bois, and it's very close to my heart. It's close to my heart because it's about art and design, which I love. And it's also close to my heart because it's about identity and humanity that transcends race, color, creed, gender, sexuality, and nationality. It's about using form to turn data into a kind of utopia, or at least a hope for utopia. The research I present today, as mentioned, is collaborative, and it's the product of my contribution to W.E.B. Du Bois' Data Portraits, Visualizing Black America, which was edited by Whitney Battle Baptiste and Brett Russert, who were mentioned. Um, they're scholars of Du Bois at UMass Amherst, where his papers are stored. But there are also additional essays by Mabel O. Wilson and Aldon Morris, um, who is the foremost living Du Bois scholar. Um, it's published by Princeton Architectural Press, um, I'm going to channel my inner RuPaul and say you can order it now on Amazon or you can buy it wherever fine books are sold. Um, and speaking of plugs, I also want to signal boost the typography in the presentation. It's designed by Trey Seals, who is a young black type designer of vocal type. And he has been working on digitizing the type from Du Bois's diagrams into a font family called 
William. And so uh, I'm wondering if I could have y'all's permission to take you on a journey through time and space. And on that journey, I need to give a trigger warning because I'm going to use historical terms that were appropriate at the time said, but they may conflict, conflict with our contemporary language. And I do use humor, gallows humor, really, to talk um, and, and sort of ground my perspective because doing this research was very intense and had a lot of darkness to it. But I think ultimately Du Bois's mission and the work here was about creating light and uh, a better future for people of color. And so uh, because there's a lot that I'm gonna cover, I'm also gonna break it down into a few chunks, um, sort of like coursing a meal. So we're gonna start with an amuse-bouche called the color line. The appetizer is the Negro exhibit. The entree has two parts. It's the Georgia Negro and a series of statistical charts illustrating the condition of the descendants of former African slaves now in residence in the United States of America, which I'll just shorten to a series of charts. We're gonna have a dessert, which is about my art and design history. And I think how my research and us looking at these pieces from over a hundred years ago could affect how we teach art and design moving forward. And then I'll wash it all down with a quote from James Baldwin, who is someone I really turn to um, to make sense of a lot of the subjects I'll be talking about. So to start, um, there's this quote from Du Bois where he says, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Widely known to be a prolific author, renowned sociologist, fierce civil rights advocate, and co-founder of the NAACP, as well as a historian of Black lives, W.E. Du Bois was also a pioneer of data visualization. This is one of his most famous quotes, and it comes from his seminal Souls of Black Folk, which came out in 1903. But it's also a quote you'll see in the plates themselves. And that's because he gave a lecture also in 1900 when these plates were completed and put on display in Paris that cuts through this intersection of race and class. And it's interesting because he actually got the phrase from Frederick Douglass. So Frederick, Frederick Douglass is the one that talks about the color line, but then Du Bois is the one that really propagates it. And Du Bois would explore this notion of a color line in literal and metaphorical ways in a contribution of approximately 60 data visualizations or infographics that was on view at the Exposition Universale or the World's Fair in Paris and was part of an exhibition um, that was dedicated to African-Americans since emancipation that was called the Exposition des Negres Américains or the American Negro. And these are all made by hand. They're all one-offs. Um, they're 24 by 28 inches, um, made in ink, gouache, watercolor, graphite, and sprinkling of photographic prints. And they were made in a collaborative um, way by not designers, but actually sociologists. So we're going to go back in time and I'm going to frame more the exhibition itself and how Du Bois became involved in it. So, of course, we have William Edward Burgert um, Du Bois, who is the sort of chief architect of the exhibition, but he was actually commissioned by Thomas Julius Calloway, who was a lawyer, educator, and also a Fisk University graduate. So Du Bois knew him uh, as an undergrad. And he was also, uh, Calloway was also the editor of the Colored American newspaper in Washington, DC, who was the one who put Du Bois and um, actually asked him to collaborate with Booker T. Washington, um, who has a very different perspective on uh, the Black, person's role in society. And they, um, even though they respected each other and Du Bois would have Booker T. Washington read drafts of his writing and vice versa, they were pretty much frenemies and, and had a totally different perspective because Du Bois is coming from a New England framework and Booker T. Washington is coming from this agrarian South, but both are instrumental in setting up the impact of historically black colleges and, and creating this educational space for people of color in the United States. And so, um, du Bois, or as he was called, Webb to his friends, this is a photo of him in Paris in 1900, 
um, preparing for the World's Fair where his data portraits were on display. Uh, I just want you to note the top, ha the top hat. He had baller head gear and style and he knew about projecting uh, an image. And there's a quote um, where he talks about himself. He describes himself as in general thought and conduct, I became quite thoroughly New England. So this is someone who was born in 1868, five years after the Emancipation Proclamation began to free slaves in America. So he was born free. Um, he was raised by a single mother and grandmother. He went to Fisk University in Tennessee, as mentioned, and then Harvard for a second bachelor's and a PhD in sociology. He was the first black man to do this. Even before this picture would have been taken, he did a fellowship in Berlin. So he would have been familiar with Europe. And um, to prepare for the exhibit, he began assembling it actually quite late in 1898, in December 28th. And so with the exposition beginning on April 15, 1900, and the travel would take at least six weeks by ship, Du Bois didn't have very much time. So he enlisted his students um, at Atlanta University, where he taught and, and worked with both women and men of color. And so these uh, infographics were the product of multiple forms of collaboration and co-creation. There's many references in the diagrams to Atlanta University, and that was um, very much uh, sort of expressed um, as they were presented. There was a Atlanta University alumnus, William Andrew Rogers, who had recently received his bachelor's degree in sociology, who was ostensibly the point person for making and courting this design and production for the actual graphics. There are few records that remain about the working methods of Rogers, who may have been living in St. Petersburg, Virginia when he worked on the project. And based on the volume of the designs and each piece's complexity and this compressed timeline, it seems implausible that it was only Rogers and Du Bois that worked alone to complete this project. And they no, no doubt facilitated renderings and typesetting from other unnamed Atlanta University students and alumni who also were collecting the field data. I wanna quote from Britt and um, Whitney's essay um, that's talking about the sort of collaborative aspect of the work, both in terms of its making, but its reception. So they write, the collaborative nature of work that went into the construction of the images as well as their public exhibition illuminate Du Bois's investment in a truly public sociology. Du Bois also turned to Atlanta alumni to con con construct a robust network of field researchers across the South. Black women were among the field researchers who contributed their expertise and labor to the Atlanta studies. We might further speculate on how white working class patrons touring the American Negro exhibit in Paris interpreted and made meaning of this data on their own terms. Here, both viewers of the infographics and black study participants in the US South come into view as legitimate co-producers of sociological knowledge. On the flip side in the process, uh, Webb is really stressed. And this is a, a picture of his badge um, uh, as an exhibitor. Um, but he writes in his own journals that um, the details of finishing these 50 or more charts and colors with accuracy was terribly difficult with little money, limited time, and not too much encouragement. I was threatened with nervous prostration before I was done and had little money left to buy passage to Paris, nor was there a cabin left for sale but the exhibit would fail unless I was there. So the last moment I bought passage in steerage and went over and installed the work. So it's this crazy paradox that this um, amazing black intellectual actually travels less um, in a class less than the graphic design. Like it was easier for the design to get there than it was for him. And so that um, kind of image of a reverse middle passage is a really, um, unsettling tension. And so when Du Bois arrived in Paris, just giving you a bit of context, like this is, you know, the fin de Salis, it's the end of this sort of Victorian cynicism and pessimism and ennui, and sort of he would be walking in the shadow of the newly constructed Eiffel Tower built in 1889. And then the exhibition itself has a pretty intense architectural context with these beaux arts um, ask buildings uh, with the United States positioned prominently for the first time 
near other uh, pavilions for France and Germany and these other superpowers. So it was very much this like political um, sort of coming out party for the United States. However, the exhibition itself, because of, you know, discrimination was placed in this sort of uh, unfortunate corner. This is the floor plan for the Palace of Social Economy. Um, and so there's nothing really auspicious about this space. Um, and it's interesting if you look at the thumbnails, maybe difficult to see over Zoom, but there are, um, they're sort of next to sort of commercial presentations. So like Prudential Life Insurance has a double display outside of the entrance of the palace. Um, there's like uh, the American Library Association, Equitable Life Insurance Society. So there's a, a kind of like dryness to this sort of context. Um, but what's interesting is that the exhibition that Du Bois designs actually ends up winning a gold prize um, as one of the best designs at the fair. Um, and there is a, a potential impact of like 30 million people visited the fair. So not sure how many actually made it to the exposition, um, but that is sort of interesting to think about the potential impact and influence of these um, designs, which in addition to the posters and the plates, which I'll talk about the most, there was this haptic interactive experience where the designs are on these wingback frames that a fair viewer could turn. And there's actually like user experience directions for the viewer to turn the frame. And part of the strategy of this installation, it's not the typical diorama tabletop model presentation that you would have seen from other um, presenters, which would be sort of like if you ever go to the Natural History Museum or something like that, we have like kind of a diorama recreating historical scene. This has a very rational and like pre-modern presentation of tons of information that he and Booker T. Washington collected from students, faculty of the Tuskegee Institute, Howard University, the Hampton, Uni Hampton Institute, and other black college and industrial schools. And the idea was to sort of educate patrons about forms of education and uplift occurring at black institutions. And it was an eclectic set of objects, images and texts, including framed photographic portraits of prominent African-American leaders and politicians, tools, harnesses, and other agricultural products from black industrial schools, and a bronze statuette of Frederick Douglass, including an on-site collection of over 250 publications authored by African-Americans and one of the photo frames was actually carved by a former slave. And you also have like patents and, you know, other kind of amazing representations of black culture society. Um, here's Du Bois's uh, gold prize. And then the exhibition had a second life where it actually toured around the United States, um, mainly funded by black women um, society, uh, folks, so this is a souvenir from the American Negro Exhibition at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo in 1901. And um, in the photo, you can see that the exhibition had this modularity. So it's like reconfigured to fit the space, even though it has the same elements. And then you can see Du Bois standing, looking at one of the books. And then uh, TJ Calloway is actually sitting there and he's actually holding a copy of The Colored American, which actually has a picture of the exhibit on the cover. So this idea of it kind of coming back to the States is like another aspect of that. Uh, to get into the diagrams themselves, I actually want you to hear from Du Bois himself. So I'm gonna play a couple minute um, recording from an interview uh, that Du Bois did in the 60s, in 1968. Um, Moses Ash, who's a well-known black journalist and um, interviewer, uh, has him take an account of his life and he's talking about when he first arrived to Atlanta University, a couple years before these were finished. So we're gonna play that now. In uh, 1897, I went to Atlanta University and stayed there 13 years making a systematic study of the American Negro, which wasn't well done because we didn't have money enough or personnel to carry it out. But nevertheless, it's fair to say that for the next 25 years, there wasn't a book 
published on legal problem that didn't have to depend upon what we were doing at Atlanta University. It was the first study of the sort. Ours was the first institution in the United States, white or black, that had any course on the history of the American Negro, or on Negro history in general. So that it was a good beginning. But while I was there, my faith in knowledge as a solution of the Negro problem was shaken. Uh, lynching was common before I went away from there uh, there was an average of one lynching every week for some years and it was a terrible sort of thing there was one uh, case very near Atlanta in which I knew from my studies, just what had happened. It was a case of a Negro peasant not receiving his wages at the end of the season. He got in a fight with his uh, hirer and killed him and uh, ran away. And then when they couldn't find him, they uh, raised the altogether new issue that he had raped the man's wife, which was evidently just dragged in. Well, I had a letter, which I hadn't delivered, to Joel Chandler Harris, uh, the uh, author of the Uncle Remus Tales. He was then on the Atlanta Constitution. So I took that letter and started downtown to deliver it to him and to talk to him about this situation. And on the way down, I found that this Negro, Sam Hose, had been caught and lynched and that in the meat market, which was on the way that I had to pass, his uh, fingers and toes were being exhibited. Well, I didn't deliver the letter. I went back to Atlanta University. And then I made up my mind that knowledge wasn't enough. That even if people were ignorant of essential matters which they had to know, they wouldn't correct their actions without more realization of just what the difficulties were. They, they had not only to know, but they had to act. And so this um, exhibition and all this work, I now understand the fervor and intensity and the labor and the imperativeness of why Du Bois and his students rallied to make such a complex um, and uh, rich documentation. And because Du Bois had done a few different studies already before producing this, his own dissertation at Harvard, which was about the transatlantic slave trade and also a study of black folks in Philadelphia called the Philadelphia Negro, he had experience with taking complex sets of data and putting them to uh, a visual narrative. And so in the plate of the first um, uh, series of posters, which is dealing with all data just from Georgia, he, just, he doesn't just show Georgia, he shows the globe, this transatlantic network of the migration of people of color through the triangle trade and slavery. And Mabel Wilson has a really amazing um, essay in the book talking about the, the sort of use of cartography and cartography as a tool to make visible the invisible, the sort of unseen objects. And so um, this idea of literally visually guiding us to understand this network better is critical in Du Bois's intentions. And he also starts off the start of this set with this set of proclamation of the laundry list of things that you'll see. So charts, maps. Um, and then I love this term, other devices <laughs> designed to illustrate the development of the American Negro in a single typical state of the United States and including the quote he's almost most known for, the color line quote. And that set 
is paired with another set of posters that's specifically about national data. So this is data that he gathered from his um, sociolo sociologist students by like looking at the US census and other national archives. I'm sure he used the Library of Congress um, and why the these prints now are housed in the Library of Congress, um, which is interesting because he did make communication after the US tour of like wanting to get them back, but um, never did. And then they were discovered, you know, later in the century when they were digitized or rediscovered. And to me, this second um, cover is so visually different than the other one, which I think also adds evidence that this was a distributed team of makers working on different compositions. And they use this engineering lettering template as a way to sort of like create systematic elements along with a, a recognizable color palette that you see um, here you see this kind of proclamation in type and image form, both of the statement, but also that it's made by Atlanta University students. Um, and you see telltale gouache uh, that's being used, which is interesting because if you think about Swiss graphic design pedagogy in the 60s that gets imported to the United States, gouache and uh, sort of like a flat paint um, used to render graphics by hand, it becomes like a core teaching methodology, um, as well as the notion of a grid, which is interesting because if you look at the type, it's unusually designed for the time. It looks like a sans serif, which in a sense it is, but it has no curves. So it's definitely some kind of like engineering letter lettering template that was probably made for architects or engineers rather than graphic designers. And based on their lack of training, it's no doubt that they customize the template. And you can actually see in the accents, the diacritic marks, this is probably a template for English only. And knowing that he was speaking to this global audience um, that also included French speakers, a lot of the titles and text are rendered in both English and French. <clears throat> this um, work is made a decade before the rise of the dominant European avant-garde movements. And these works predate modular design elements often considered to have their origins in Russian constructivist, de style and Italian futurism. And there's a lot of intentionality in the graphic quality of these things that are made. Like if you look closely, no, that's not someone drinking too much coffee. Like the, this sort of ragged torn edge, it to me is like a, a graphic textural representation of the pain and trauma that's connected to this idea of slavery and literally like those losing their blood. At the same time, there is a reoccurring use of abstract shapes that are built from triangles, circles, and rectangles in bright primary colors or black and white. And so to me, I am um, very much seeing these forms and thinking of forms like, for instance, Herbert Byers' universal alphabet that he designs in 1926, one of the first students who becomes a, ma a master of the Bauhaus and starts running the type shop and graphic design program there he is making this sort of set of forms from circles in this case. Or this chart um, on assessed valuation of all taxable property. Uh, I think the titles are really important to consider because Du Bois is making and framing this argument that black folks are just like other people. Like we pay taxes, we own property, we have um, furniture in our kitchen. That's like one of the data sets coming up. But this um, graphic form really speaks to like Kandinsky's color tests, right? That he gives his students where like yellow is like a particular shape, red is a particular shape, um, blue is a particular shape, but the um, finesse and the, the craft um, and, and kind of an aesthetic that is not sort of the clean modernism that we sort of think about with the Bauhaus, which those of you who know Bauhaus history is much more complex usually than it's even discovered. But in addition to uh, sort of anticipating future lineages, Du Bois is very much tied into what's come before him. So he would have definitely known about William Playfair, who's the Scottish statistician who created the first pie chart, of which this is an example from 1805. And I have no doubt he would have known about Florence Nightingale, who created this rose diagram. She was a nurse um, for the British Army. And in 1859, with Harriet Martineau, 
um, ends up creating this book that has data uh, and it's this like literary account of the Crimean War and using Nightingale's statistical studies and her creating her own chart type called the Rose Diagram, which is a remix of Playfair's pie chart. She actually convinces the British government to give more funding for um, healthcare and, and support for the troops. And so again and again in the plates, you see innovations that Du Bois is doing here. We have, um, literally bags of money that are representing uh, value of land owned by Georgian Negroes, um, which uh, to me, I have the caption wrong on this because I, I just threw this in, but uh, it looks just like Otto Neurath, Otto and Marie Neurath's isotype, which doesn't happen until the 30s or 40s. And so um, when you see these colors and shapes and typography of the charts, they're foreshadowing critical developments in the history of data visualization, including uh, simpl simplified pictographic form like the isotype picture language, which we associate with pretty much every logo on every interface on our smartphones, right? What was super crafty also about the, the teams is that they would take the same kind of data. So this is about colorism, basically. So like hierarchy of sort of acceptance based on, you know, more slave descent or more you know, mixed descent. And so that was the chart for the um, Georgia data. And then this is the chart for the national data. So they're the same kinds of information, but they're represented in different graphic structures and probably by different teams. You can also note there's letterpress that starts to show up in the second set, which I think had to do with the timeline. Like they're running out of time. They can't even use the um, template anymore. So they're combining and improvising typographically, um, which then also like the ingenuity of this makes me think of like the history of like monochrome painting and, you know, um, combines or like Ellsworth Kelly's paintings. Um, and there's an incredible level of sophistication of like grid alignment, layout, orientation. Um, unfortunately, because of the paper stock there, papers on this wood pulp paper that's why these haven't been displayed or shown there's like a fair amount of decay and damage on a number of different um, plates but you can also see this like secretarial hand this like upright italic um, that's coming in here that's probably the penmanship of Du Bois's students um, most likely the women um, and then just like Du Bois and his team have these like amazing ways of making new chart types. So this I call a Du Boisian spiral that's talking about something quite quotidian, household kitchen furniture, um, but has this uh, graphic language that anticipates the work of Joseph Miller Brockman of the sort of Swiss school of international modernism. They have these detailed maps. Um, it's one of my favorite that um, uses almost kind of what we would now call a heat map, which is something that got pioneered in the 90s by um, Cormac McCarthy, who's a data visualization uh, person, but was already actually being done by Du Bois. Um, another Du Boisian spiral about city and rural population. And just the innovation of these different diagrammatic formats happen with this like interlaced diagram of better literacy which was a, a pretty big um, important aspect of sort of like talking about the so, so social evolution of people of color. And then I'm gonna close with this plate, which to me looks like it could have been designed in like Adobe Creative Suite because of its complexity of form. Um, we have multiple levels of hierarchy, data visualization, photographic prints, there's even this gold seal. And then again, at the bottom, you have this haptic call to raise the statistics um, or raise the frame to see further statistics. And so for me, adding Du Bois to sort of like quote unquote canon of design history makes me question my own design history. Like why wasn't I exposed to this? And like, I had really good teachers. Like I had Doug Silver Fox Scott who still teaches design history at RISD and the, the rain fierce wild who um, teaches design history still at CalArts. 
And, you know, I was thinking about the lineage of their teachers and their influences, you know, like Phil Meggs, who wrote the first um, book of the history of graphic design or some of the sort of uh, both European but American faculty at Yale where both of these um, amazing people were educated. So like Paul Rand, Bradbury Thompson, there's also Lou Danziger, who is the one who creates the first design history course um, for graphic designers in like the 70s at, at Cal Arts and Art Center, which was an influence on Lorraine. And then of course, Kathy McCoy, who was Lorraine's teacher at Cranbrook. Um, but I'm just like, why, where am I in this? And, and generally, I would say there's some nuance now, but like the, the framework for what history is considered, and I think this is the case for architecture too, is sort of like, who, who, what is the canon of whether it's like modernism or, you know, the architecture that comes before that, that are sort of like the key celebrities, you know, or key things you need to know from the like cuneiform or Last Cow's Cave, you know, Art Nouveau, Bauhaus, etc. And that usually stops kind of like in the 80s. Um, 83 was when Meg's um, wrote his first book and I know that there's shifts there, but still that's generally a construct. So what if you had a design history framework that is more nodal, like uh, this idea of a chosen family, you know? So we can think about influences like um, Gropius, Gropius and uh, Herbert Beyer as like student teacher or Joseph Mueller Brockman and Max Bill as contemporaries or um, Carl Gerson and Ar Armin Hoffman as like colleagues at the same school. And then suddenly you can kind of create your own um, chosen kind of matrix, like I can choose Du Bois, even though he never was my teacher, I can add him to my network. And I think particularly in these conversations around the decolonization of design history curriculums, once you start to introduce an element like Du Bois, there's suddenly a reframing of what's considered major and what's considered minor. And so this idea of like uh, lenses potentially, or like influences suddenly you have to reconsider like you know Kandinsky was 19 when the fair opened did he go and see this work you know um this idea of like interconnectedness that we m don't normally think of and you could extend this to and I'm starting to do this to design history curriculum so where the the primary narrative of say 30s and 40s streamlining and automobiles gets reframed when you introduce Victor Hugo Green's Motorist Green Book, which talks about discrimination and persecution, uh, the use of highways. Um, or, you know, if you think of the Eames Aluminum Group, which comes out in 1968, which is the same year as the um, I Am a Man Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike, that is Martin Luther King's last speech before he's assassinated, uh, you have like one set of Americans reclining in a lounger and another set of Americans literally like marching through refuse with design, you know, held up, uh, fighting for their lives and for their jobs. And so that suddenly then creates a new potential way of navigating design history. And for me to close, and I know I've given you a lot to digest, I think it, it it's helpful to come back to someone I kind of think is patron saint of culture and history of America and, um, you know, particularly as like a queer, out queer black um, thinker and just how influential he was um, is, is very much an uh, inspiration to me. He has a quote that he wrote in an essay that was published in Ebony in August 1965 called White Man's Guilt. Um, and you can read it in some of his collective writing. It's called The Price of the Ticket. Um, but he, he talks about the paradox of, on the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. And he further goes into sort of this like great pain and terror <laughs> that you can realize when you start to assess that history, the history which has been placed is one that's formed from one's own point of view. And you suddenly with this new awareness, you're entering into the battle with the historical creation or, or canon and you attempt to recreate yourself according to principles that are more humane or more liberating and, and ideally to a level of personal maturity and freedom, which can 
then rob history of its tyr tyrannical power. And that act can also change history. So I wanted to say thank you and I encourage you all um, in our discussion and moving on to think about ways that you can recreate your own histories, both for yourself and for others. Thank you. Thank you, Silas. Thank you so much for what an incredibly inspiring um, set of graphics that we are all going to dwell on and um, for just really what a charge for all of us. Um, I think it's a great statement for us at the beginning of this um, new conversation series that we're all gonna start engaging with. And I really appreciate the, the call to action that you brought to all of us, not only by sharing yourself so fully and so personally, but also to kind of think through the ways that we've been assembling these narratives for such a long period of time. Um, I think one of the things that we can do to start is to talk about, I mean, there were so many things that were inspiring. And for those of you that are watching at home or watching on the third floor right now, uh, John, and Silas and I had the opportunity to talk uh, before this uh, session and really had a fabulous conversation. I hope that we can bring that energy and that kind of inspiration and looseness and sharing together um, into this session. So we're gonna try to recreate something that was very spontaneous before, <laughs> but um, something that really caught my ear this time that you were sharing it is that I've always uh, you know, learned in my own history, right, that. W.E.B. Du Bois was one of the greatest intellectuals of our time. Like he really changed and shaped the way that we conceived of ourselves as a culture, as a society. But what I find so inspiring about the project and, and certainly in the way that you were framing it, especially in the last um, uh, fourth, I don't know if that was the entree or the amuse <laughs> the entree yeah, exactly. third section. Yeah. <laughs> the entree. Yeah. The entree. yeah and dessert section of our class was really thinking about how Du Bois was actually one of the greatest influencers of graphic language. So not just a public intellectual, but an intellectual for graphic design. And I think you make an incredibly convincing case to reposit the position of graphic design and data visualizations with Du Bois at the very center, the very initial, or one of the voices that was at the initial onset of that. And so I thought maybe we could just kind of talk a little bit about how Du Bois has changed the way that you've started to see your own educational history and how that repositions your own voice and your own work in the world. Yeah, that's an amazing, amazing question and super astute. I, it's almost part of my response to discovering this body of work was shock. <laughs> you know, and kind of awe in the sense of um, the superb rigor of them visually and how expressive and unique they were. And then uh, mixed with a great tragedy <laughs> of, of wondering and scratching my head, why didn't I not encounter this, uh, encounter his work, um, you know, until, you know, well after leaving school. Um, and I think that, I think what you're sort of talking about is like this book, many other people's research about these designs are undoing the erasure that happened for various reasons of Du Bois. Some of that was intentional by his colleagues in sociology. Aldon Morris can tell you more about that in his um, book, The Scholar Denied, um, where we now sort of realize what he was doing at Atlanta University was very innovative and cutting edge and created a modern sociology that predates sort of what we think of as the uh, University of Chicago um, school. Um, and then um, I think another aspect of uh, reframing him and putting him sort of centering him in this is sort of what are the other connections you know, between his work and say the work of things we know, like the Bauhaus or influence that, influences that came before him. I mean, I found some of them, but I 
I think there's so much more research to do about like what was the reception of this in Europe, you know, potentially, and how it might have um, affected or influenced others. Um, and then I'm like, what are other missing pieces of design in the history of data visualization, right? Like that, like going forward, what else have we lost? Um, and and part of the other reason I just had lost a thought, and I'm just coming back to it, is the plates were one-offs. There weren't multiples, and that had to do with like the budget availability for a team of black researchers, right? That there was a limited budget that they couldn't make multiples. And another reason why they were kind of erased or at least forgotten, because they kind of went into the archives of the uh, Library of Congress and didn't emerge until decades later. That was one of the other questions I wanted to ask was, you know, you showed the printing presses and you showed, I think, that incredible lineage of, you know, uh, black men and women and students at, um, who are all kind of coming together to not only do the field research, but to also produce the work. And that that authorship still living in the work, but you showed that image of the printing press. And I was like, wait, yeah. was this like, how was this distributed? So that was a good kind of interesting clarifying moment. Yeah. And, heartbreaking. and I'll also just add a heartbreaking, heartbreaking recognition that the work itself was able to physically travel to Paris with mm. ease than the, the author. Yeah, I mean, that says something about sort of um, the sort of reclassification of um, people by race, right? In the sense that the devaluing of him as a human being, whereas his scholarship um, was elevated and allowed to transport because of its material form. And it's also really interesting as a design challenge, like, you know, they had to make this quick exhibition that had to be spatial, but then had to cross a continent. And so I think the innovations in its modularity, the, the teamwork of working together, and also like what scholar-led design research. I mean, I think that there's a whole lot to unpack that really connects to our practice now as educators, you know, especially like at a research university. Um, and this idea of like, undergraduate research that has become such an important part of our world now. You know, he really was pioneering that. And I think there's also something really just like that makes my heart warm about the collectiveness of it. Like he, even though he is this sort of like figurehead of intellectual prowess, he really distributed his expertise and the credit, right? Like putting his students right in type on the pieces. It's pretty profound. So another, or John, did you want to ask a question? I know. I did have a question, but you can, you can go ahead, Karen. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, so I think, you know, that kind of idea of the collective is so valuable and really important for us to think about um, as we do our design work. Um, you also shared something, I mean, hearing W.E.D. Bois uh, voice in the presentation was extremely powerful, and especially speaking about his uh, disillusionment with the the power of what his work could achieve. And I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the power of information, and certainly in this incredible moment of the pandemic, where we are seeing so clearly and I mean the New York Times did a, a piece so clearly on the redlining and how that redlining has also then still resides in the pandemic and that mm. black and brown people are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and how do we start to I, I wonder about the power of visualizing and also do you sympathize with Du Bois's disenchantment uh, I can relate to it. I I definitely understand why he became so radical <laughs> at the end of his life. Um, you know, he was profiled by the FBI and, you know, he, he becomes, you know, socialist basically. And eventually he flees America, like he goes to Africa because he just feels like he's disconnected to what's happening. Um, at the same time, before he does that, and through his whole life, he is so dedicated to uh, an output of creative 
um, industry, you know, editing the crisis magazine and art directing that, um, you know, these various um, reports that he does, the Philadelphia Negro um, that has data visualization. Of course, these pieces, um, he writes books and plays and even speculative fiction, um, poetry, like he, he trudges on, even though there is a little bit of like uh, sadness, but in terms of like, I think at the time he was making the plates, um, he was very optimistic about the power of abstraction. And I think that's another takeaway from this work is rather than sort of dealing with stereotypical illustrations or rendering of people of color by putting it in like cold hard data and then also beautiful form, it's a way to sort of see the immenseness of the problem and also to kind of have a cold rationality behind it. And I think the th thing you mentioned about the New York Times and like other data visualization about the impact of COVID. Um, and then I guess you can also extend that to um, our, our total crisis with policing right now. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity to, to use the numbers as a tool to create change. And I think they could be really helpful in contentious conversations around like, what is the future of, um, you know, police or this idea of like societal support and um, regulation of sort of law that doesn't <laughs> kill people. Um, and so data I think could be, could be an amazing tool. So I have a I have a question for you that that ties in well with this uh, discussion of data or the hard the kind of cold hard data um, and the uses of cold hard data sometimes. Uh, a number of times in your talk, I noticed that you uh, you kind of relied on the infrastructure or the metaphor of infrastructure. You talked about how. Um, you know, he and his collaborators use engineering typefaces and they, they construct this kind of like mini bureaucracy that tells the story of black Americans because the US government isn't telling the story of black Americans. So they have to, you know, create their own um, kind of, uh, you know, structure that they can be heard or be kind of seen. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, this was, this was really kind of fascinating um, uh, that, you know, because it, it ties in with the historically black colleges um, that they were meant to be places that, um, you know, where where basically black Americans could construct their own educational system. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this idea of creating your own infrastructure and how that disrupts the other really amazing memorable phrase, the um, modernist celebrity clothesline of history, <laughs> which, which is, right. I, you know, I, I, I love it. I think it's, I think it's a great idea that, um, you know, there's a, there is a, or there are a series of, um, you know, dominant infrastructures and that he's proposing a way of constructing uh, an alternative. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could see any parallels in, in, in that, not to stretch our engineering and, and infrastructure. No, I love it. I, I have never really considered it through that metaphor, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, because Du Bois is a builder over the course of his career, you know, from the collective, the Niagara Group, um, to uh, the Pan-African Congress, which he's a founding member of that happens on his trip to Europe. Um, he was very much interested in setting up systems, I think probably because they didn't exist. And so he was like, like let me let me create uh, a publication for the NAACP, right? Let me create a sociology department. And so I think he was um, very ambitious in terms of um, being an uh, information architect, I guess is like one way to think about it. And he um, was very savvy about um, rhetoric, you know, and I think the the diagrams are a way way for him was for him to build a different image of black people and he does you're right kind of circumvent normal political structures and through tj's contact with the library of congress and kind of a governmental office he's able to make this very public argument for equality using like all of the means of like abstraction modernism um and then as far as you know the timeline is considered 
like the my argument has more power because I'm using Du Bois's techniques, right? Like if I had just said those things rather than showed you what the the clothesline looks like or what other models could look like, I think that shows you the power of design to change a kind of consciousness, to change a kind of um, mental structure. And Du Bois was excellent at that. And one could say that design is that. And design history is super interesting to me because it is something that is showing us who we are in material form. So, so that's really interesting. And it, it prompts me to ask a kind of follow-up um, about this, because we're, we're talking about history, which I didn't expect us to be talking about, which, but it's great and it's uh, wonderful um, that we're doing this. And, um, you know, the, the thing about Du Bois is, is that he's a sociologist and the sociologists nowadays make sure, make very sure that everyone knows that he was a sociologist and he wasn't a historian, even though, you know, the, his book on Black Reconstruction was, you know, 80 or no, not 80, but 50 years before anyone else kind of took his, before we began to reconsider what the Reconstruction era meant. Um, you know, that was in the 1980s, and he was writing about it in the 30s. So he's had this, uh, you know, uncanny ability to be part of the avant-garde, even though he doesn't care that he's part of the avant-garde, right? He makes his own kind of avant-garde well before lots of other people do it. And does this lead you to think, you know, when we're talking about how we teach history, you know, should we be thinking about it in, instead of as like a series of avant-gardes that replace one another? and push the field forward? Should we be using other ways of thinking about how design changes or how we, how we, we um, come up with new ideas essentially? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think that our conception, you know, going back to Baldwin of what history is, is always informed by our present. And I, now that I'm thinking about sort of your previous question too about infrastructure or connection, I feel like you could say the same thing for history as well, like we, we can reconstruct ways that we build history. And I'm also thinking about design teams, like I'm thinking about how we're working now in this COVID reality of Zooms and tools like Figma and, and Google Drive and Dropbox and how we can, kind of, we, we can create networks of, of history, of education. In fact, last summer with Louise Sandhouse, um, she and I created this, uh, informal group called Design History Friday. This is before COVID where we were just meeting on Fridays every few weeks and people were presenting emerging research and design history, mainly graphic designers, but they're curators, uh, folks from the Cooper Hewitt, um, from LACMA, um, sort of from all over the country. And it, it did become this kind of place and it continues to be a place where we're reworking, like, how do you teach? And then when we had COVID, it became a support group for like, how are you dealing with, you know, teaching design history in this context? And then going into the fall, we've been meeting again about dealing with this massive change in curriculum. And I think we really need, we need our networks and, and this idea of like a collective um, unearthing of the knowledge because it's just no one academic or scholar can really handle the shifts that are necessary. Uh, we have a couple of really fantastic comments that are coming in through the YouTube uh, channel. So I wanna take a minute to pivot into some of those questions. Um, the first, we'll start with a comment and I am speaking on behalf of this uh, person. Um, so first, unbelievable work. Uh, I'm a follower of Du Bois and had not realized his design uh, background and the imagery that he produced. So really fantastic to see. As a black man, um, now I can link my readings of the Philadelphia Negro, Souls of Black Folk and Black Reconstruction to this imagery for my own empowerment. Mm, that's amazing. I'm so glad that I was able to introduce you to this work because it's changed my conception of my own blackness of Du Bois of, you know, the beginning of the 20th century. So I, I wish you um, uh, to enjoy and savor the exploration. Yeah, this has been an incredible uh, opportunity for all of us to think about. I mean, it's really incredible too. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm going to take away from anybody. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, exactly. I, I feel it. <laughs> I'm inspired too. But but yes, as a black man, I think this has got to really uh, resonate with a lot of a lot mm -hmm. of that recognition. Um, another. And that's. I mean, you're you bringing that up is like 
partly the power of it, right? This abstraction, like we can all connect to the form because we we understand what he's communicating. and We realize how revolutionary what he's doing. And so I think that's one of the benefit about expanding this conversation is having new perspectives. Yes, it's nice for those of us who are POC to see more possibility models, but it also I think enhances all of our understanding of history and culture, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's so, it's, it's really inspiring. Um, another question coming from uh, Professor Jake Boswell. Um, so Jake is thinking about the graphic products like the, um, hold on, Scribner's. Mm. <laughs> Scribner's illustrated census documents um, that were also produced around the same time, trying to create a kind of national, very positive national portrait of the US which largely ignores race. Could we see Du Bois's work as a response to some of that early um, highly graphic work and maybe an attempt to complicate it? Yeah, I think that's a great point um, because uh, Du Bois is such a uh, scavenger of information and like um, a, a contrarian and I could see him doing an exhaustive, you know, literature review. I mean, that's that's why I have those references to other forms of sociological data and visualization. And he was very much interested in uh, what was missing in the discourse. And that's, I think, why he ends up building so many things to create counter narratives. Um, I'm gonna look at those. Uh, more closely, like I know of them, but haven't spent a lot of time with those documents. And it's interesting because it ends up, um, you can kind of see Du Bois' work that supports later in the Harlem Renaissance, Elaine Locke ends up editing a special issue of the survey graphic, which is like an illustrated uh, accompaniment to um, the, a similar sociological kind of journal that's happening. And he does it, that's where he coins the term, the new Negro. And it, it's sort of interesting to think about the two of them as sort of like, uh, had totally different perspectives on what like black thought or black culture should be, you know, Elaine Locke more about beauty and art for art's sake, whereas Du Bois had this very like radical political bent and that he was very interested in um, using kind of protest as a vehicle. And so I think your question is really apt in the sense that he, he would be producing a counter argument to what he was seeing. I think one other uh, comment that has kind of come in is that uh, we have a sort of history at the um, Ohio State University with um, Lorraine Wild, who designed the first four source books that the Knowlton School um, did. So oh, amazing. Uh, you know, a small world to say the very, very least. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I adore her. She's, uh, you know, an incredible mentor still is to this day. And, um, you know, really opened up a lot for me in terms of not only design history, but book design. And, um, you know, she has an amazing track record for designing books related to architecture in particular and a particular sensitivity. and. I uh, was like honored to work with her and be her student. And um, I think a lot of that amazing way of questioning thought models that she has and like her rigorous scholarship uh, definitely inspired me so much. So it's really cool to have that connection. I want to also make a small correction because I realized that um, I've said the names of some people who've spoken um, and made comments here, but not all. And recognizing the the sort of erasure of black voices, I think is really important that we recognize. So a shout out to Ed Chapman Jr. who made that incredible comment about the beautiful work. So I wanna let you know that we-, we Thank you, Ed. That's good. To, it's good to know that put the name with the comment, which was really well said. Thank you. Yeah. That really made me that made my day. <laughs> Thank you. I think it made my day too. So I think um, unless there are any other questions that come through or anything like that, oh, I think I see something from Ed again. Let's see. How does Silas link the readings data to the imagery for empowerment? The readings are extremely dense with hardcore facts. 
uh, the readings like on the plates themselves? Is that sort of what, sort of? I oh, the readings of Du Bois maybe is, is he talking about? Okay. Chime uh, in, Ed. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, that's, I mean, I think the way I would maybe answer that question is, you know, to um, John's point about Black Reconstruction and like that is a tome, right? That's <laughs> like 800 pages of like, like argument. It's really a lot to take in and grapple with. I think the, the diagrams, both in, um, you know, the Philadelphia Negro and this project that I showed and, and subsequent research projects are about creating a distillation. And they're about creating like access to, you know, he's done his homework, but then sometimes it's overwhelming to process. And so I think the data visualization was a way to make it open, you know, to greater audiences. I think he was really interested in his ideas having the most impact to the most people. And so it would make sense that he would use graphics as a way to do that. Can I jump in and ask a kind of follow up to Ed's, um, I think really good question, because it leads into one of the themes that you spoke about, which is this idea of rhetoric and persuasion. And so having worked with Du Bois's material, um, do you, do you, can you kind of uh, begin to sense uh, what kind of, um, what is philosophy behind um, kind of convincing people? I mean, how, did he, how did he do it? What was the most successful way of doing it and kind of what the stakes were? Did you get any sense of that um, you know, from, from looking at his work? Yeah, I mean, I feel like you can, Maybe I'll use one text, The Souls of Black Folk, um, as a way that it's like kind of his most known work. But in terms of rhetoric and the charts, and, and you see it in some of the details that I zoomed in on, he's definitely using a combination of rational argument and emotional appeal. And if you look at the text of Souls of Black Folk, which is um, uh, not perforated, but like, it contains not only text, but poetry, Negro spirituals, like lyrics, so sheet music. You know, it, it, it is this like score, like this typographic and graphic score of his sense of the spiritual or like mm, cultural history of Black folk in America. And so I, I think for him, he knows how to make an appeal, you know, that is both um, one that is sort of eros, you know, right, of sort of like emotion. I'm like trying to remember my Aristotle, you know, but he's he's also, you know, using the the more rational um, one, which I can't remember, and then also his own persona, the ethos of him is sort of this um, black intellectual, you know, radical black intellectual that is future thinking and, and pushing for change. And he will use any means necessary to do that. We have time for one last question. And I think this is a particularly powerful question. Um, and it comes from Marty Roulette. As a black man in the design field, what advice would you give some pursuing a degree in this field? Mm, that's amazing. You know, one of the most important things for me, uh, which actually did not really happen until uh, I left school was, and that actually started at the beginning of this year, was to seek out Black mentors in the design field. And so I, I found myself in January on a judges panel um, for the Type Directors Club and Dory Tunstall was on the panel and um, she is the first uh, black dean of design of OCAD University in Toronto um, appointed a few years ago. And um, she was talking about her at a certain point needing to change mentors to level up. She had an amazing mentor, but just didn't happen to be black. And she asked that person to be their mentor. And while we were like in a cab in New York City, I was like, hey, can I do that? 
with you? <laughs> Will you mentor me? And so she has done that, you know, um, since January and it's really changed my outlook. So, you know, that the, it doesn't necessarily have to be a faculty member in your department. It could be any, anyone at your institution or, um, you know, with the internet where <laughs> we're available, you know, like to connect to those who inspire us. And I think um, Dory has also encouraged me to do that to build bridges with people who inspire me from all backgrounds. But I think that um, there's something about uh, her experience and, and um, her point of view that's been really helpful to talk about sort of the the struggles of connecting it and finding their space and um you know there's so many uh possibility models that are out there i mean we're having a, a renaissance of conferences and lectures about black designers in all fields so um you know if you hear someone that inspires you i would encourage you to uh, connect with them and i'm i'm willing to do that for you if you want to exchange information uh, I, was, I think I think you're going to get a lot of interest, <laughs> I hope from uh, students and faculty alike um, are truly inspiring and of course as we mentioned um, John and Ty Van Massacres and I are all working on a seminar about the Underground Railroad right now and we already have got you slotted to come yes. and be part of the re end of the semester review so I would love that forward. I I I think that project's amazing and uh, I will do a quid pro quo, not quid pro quo, but I would love for you, I'm writing a new class about the history of black data visualization and sort of like the present of that. And I just feel like your project is so important and really cool and would love for you to share the results as it continues to evolve. Yeah, we will, we definitely are looking forward to that. So Silas, thank you very, very much. And uh, John, I'll let you say a few thanks and yeah. Silas, this has been really tremendous. Thank you so much for uh, your time and your your amazing work and your generosity. Um, we very much appreciate it. And this has been a, a wildly successful uh, first of our new format. So thank you very, very much. Right. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you both for having me and for the amazing discussion. You've given me a lot to think about <laughs> uh, after this. So I may be pinging you in the future. <laughs> We're so excited and thank you again. And thank you all of you for tuning in for this first Knowlton Conversations. I'm Karen Lewis. And I'm John Davis. Good, good night. Luck. And good luck. <laughs>